So, part two of light is refraction. The bending of light as it changes from one medium to another. And on the front page you see our famous fisherman standing there hunting the fish on the left. Now, we've already done the joke about him having extremely long legs. I actually think his boat's just sunk, personally. Anyway, so, what is actually happening? He's looking at the fish under the water and he thinks that the fish is there. He looks at it and he sees the fish there. But, of course, the fish is actually there. That's because the light which is leaving the fish is refracting into his eyes. It's not just uh, travelling in a straight line. It's travelling in a straight line to the surface where it's bent. Now, this bending is entirely due to a change of speed. Of course, the fisherman solves this problem by using a trident, a three-pronged fishing rule. He aims with the top one and hits it with the bottom one. Of course, because they're all the same, he doesn't realise that. It takes a physicist to come along to explain to him, at which point he steers him in the leg. Other effects that you can get from refraction. The ruler appears to be bent because our eyes are still convinced that light travels in straight lines. So we look at the ruler, we see that it uh, is in a different position, the lower half than the bottom half, so we construct a bent ruler rather than seeing that light is actually slowed down in the water. Another effect, of course, is the dispersion of light into its various colours, and this occurs because different frequencies uh, refract by different angles, so different amounts, if you like, causing um, it to break up into its constituent colours. And so, refraction into glass or into water. This is light travelling from a less dense medium into a more dense medium where it slows down. In order to slow down and still stay as a wavefront when it's travelling at an angle, it has to change direction, like one of your wheels getting caught in an eye patch. Ice patch? Eye patch? Has it get caught in an eye? Anyway, an ice patch. And then spinning the car at a different angle because one of the wheels is turning faster than the other or having less grip. These are all analogous effects to this idea of light bending. So refraction is the bending, but it bends from one medium to the next. As you can see, it bends depending on its instant angle. And the instant angle is always that angle. And the refracted angle is that one. And we just have to remember that always. It's not any other angle. It's the instant angle is to the normal. Of course, if we're traveling out from a dense medium into a less dense medium, then the refraction works in reverse. A small angle before becomes a larger angle afterwards and the light speeds up. So this is refraction in a glass block. Refraction towards the normal. Again, as I say, that is our eye. And this is our R, our refracted angle. It goes through the block and comes out traveling parallel to the original ray. It's displaced, but it's parallel because it's come out into the same medium again. Now, light slows down whatever you do to it. If you pass light straight through a glass block in an angle, as in the diagram on the right, with no, uh, no oblique angle, so it's traveling at uh, perpendicular to the face, it still slows down, it's just you can't see it because it doesn't have to change direction. So there we are, as I explained, angle of incidence, angle of refraction, always drawn in this way. We also put in the arrows to show the direction that the light is travelling. And if we're going to do the experiment or the experimental rise up, we need a source of light. So... The instant ray, the refracted ray and the normal all lie on the same plane. That's the same as reflection we did earlier or in the previous section. Snell's law is the second law of refraction. And this states that there's a, there's a ratio between the sine of the angle of instance and the sine of the angle of refraction, which is constant. Now, the name we give to this constant is the refractive index. It's to do with the ratio of the speeds of the wave as they travel from one medium to the other. 
This is the experiment, which you might have noticed from my voice change at the end of the slide before last was the next slide I was expecting, having not looked through it properly. <laughs> so, as you can see, this is the write-up I would expect. It's got a straight line going through the origin. It's got, uh, which proves Snell's law. And the slope of sine i over sine r is the refractive index. Now, we also have to include, if we want to do this as an experimental write-up, a laser showing um, a light source, a protractor showing how we measured the angle, and we have to label the glass block as we do with anything. Remember the rule. Remember that famous rule. Everything has to be labelled. And as I say, this is a perfect write-up. Straight line through the origin. Now, any straight line through the origin in physics means that what's on the y-axis is proportional to what's on the x-axis. So in this case, sine i is proportional to sine r, meaning if sine i gets bigger or doubles, sine r will double. So this is really what the refractive index is. C represents the speed of a wave. It's, it's come down to us now from several papers, foreign language papers. I have no idea where the letter C comes from. I, I don't know a language which C stands for speed. But C in air means the speed of the wave in air. And C in glass means the speed of the wave in the medium glass. Now, if we divide these two, as you see, we get 1.5. 1.5 is the refractive index of the glass air barrier, the glass air line, the glass air difference, whichever you like to say, where one medium becomes another, the border. I don't know how else to describe it. I'm, I'm, I, need a, I need a theosaurus here. I really do. But this is what 1.5 is. Now, we can get it from sine i, sine r. We get the same number. It is the same number, whichever way we calculate it. Hopefully. So, we can also do it this way, with real and apparent depth. You know that the swimming pool is always deeper than it looks. It's one of the first things they teach you when you go to uh, swimming lessons. And the second thing is that, you know, that if you, as soon as the instructor turns around, the bigger kids will throw you in the pool. That's the other thing you learn. Also, you learn what heavy petting is. A long time before I knew that. Anyway, the real over the apparent. Real depth is the depth the fish is actually at, and the apparent depth is what it appears from the surface, from outside the water. And if we find those ratios, that will also come to 1.5, because that's also a way of finding the refractive index, the difference in the speeds. Here's yet another method. This is using the previous method to find it, the... Uh, we look above and down onto the pin and we see the reflection of the pin, which is in the cork, and we see the image of the pin at the bottom, you see, because there is an there is a image there of the pin which is below it. And by move by finding no parallax, we can get this distance to be the same as this distance. So these two distances are the same. And then we use that distance, the second one, this one here. We measure that as the apparent depth, even though we're actually just copying this distance here. And then by using the real depth, which is also, I don't know why I've written that in, it's actually in the diagram, real depth, uh, of the thing, we can find real depth divided by apparent depth, and that will also give us the refractive index, this case of a liquid, but it can also use in a solid. You just put a mark underneath a glass block and a mirror on top of that. It's a very similar experiment. However, what we can also do with refraction, particularly if we are passing from a dense medium, glass is the most common example, to a less dense medium, is form something called total internal reflection. This is where a ray of light gets to such an angle that instead of refracting, it moves along the surface, as in the mir middle, illustra middle? middle illustration. <laughs> The angle that this happens is called the critical angle, C. I'm going to change colour again. I don't think that green is working for me. Let's try this. Yee! C, that's the critical angle there. Now, the critical angle is always, as with I and R, the angle between the normal and the ray, not between the surface and the ray. After the critical angle, i.e. when this angle, which is, I'll call that X, which is bigger 
than the critical angle, then you get total internal reflection. And this total internal reflection has a number of things. Here you can see the image, there you are, a reflected image of the person who's underneath the water on the surface. The surface acts like a mirror. And if you think you've seen this already, this is when you're some distance away from a boat underwater and you look up and all you can see is the part of the boat which is underneath the surface. Here's another example which comes from said on the right. This is called Snell's window. This area is the entire outside. This is mirror. That's total internal refraction, reflection. This is refraction out here. So all of the light coming from the surface goes into this circle, which is called Snell's window. And everything of a greater angle than this, that's total internal reflection from, from the base of the sea, from the seabed, from coming up instead of going down. So, critical angle. How do we find it? Well, basically, we use a semicircular block. This is a semicircular block. Over here, we have a laser. That's the laser there, shining light towards the surface. And initially, you get refraction. If you move the laser, so if you can see the angle of instance here, this one is slightly bigger than the one over this side, then you'll get it moving closer to the surface. Of course, if you continue that process, eventually you get a point where the light doesn't leave the block. It gets refracted, but it doesn't leave the block. It runs along the surface. When the angle gets bigger still, it no longer leaves the block. It's reflected internally, total internal reflection. Now we call it total internal reflection because even at the points above, you will get some small amount of reflection there. Now this is a small percentage of the light, but it does happen. However, once you get above the critical angle, you get nothing leaving the block. Everything stays in the block and that's total internal reflection. And of course, that is the critical angle, the point where it goes from refraction to reflection, that point where it's running along the surface is the critical angle. And once again, I cannot stress enough, it's the angle between the normal and the ray and not the ray and the surface. Now, I've just added this slide where you can see the red incoming rays and the refracted rays, just to see if that was any easier. I've looked at both of them over the years, and never been able to work out which one was easier to see. If this one's easier to see, freeze frame on this and think about this one. OK, well, we're going to use uh, Mirage. Of course, uh, this being a cartoon drawn by a man, the woman has to be looking like that. I'm not quite idea why she's wearing those bizarre sunglasses, but she is. Also, I don't know how her internal organs fit into that space in the middle of her. That seems to be rather strange. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give her a bit more. Yeah, properly, proper woman. Right, now, this is an inferior mirage, which is caused by the hot air near the surface of a desert or a road or something like that, refracting the light back up into your eyes. Because hot air is a very, very thin medium. And the, the air above the uh, hot air, which is close to the surface of the desert, is cooler. So it's denser. So this denser air gives way to less dense air as the light heads towards the desert. And what can happen if it's a very big temperature change is the lights actually change direction completely. It goes from the sky and does a complete, you know, 180 up into your eyes. There it is, comes down, reflected, reflected. It's a continual refraction because the air is slowly getting less dense as it heads towards the floor of the desert. Now we look and again, we see light can only travel in straight lines. We know that. <laughs> light straight, rah, straight lines, rah, rubbish. So we look at it, we see the blue of the sky lying on the floor and we think water. It probably got something to do with the fact we're fairly thirsty at this point as well. But as it appears on films as well, I think this is this is a true or inferior mirage. It's interesting that a true mirage, i.e. something which is caused by light, is called inferior. And the superior mirage is the one where Claudia Schiffer is walking to, towards you holding a, a pint of beer. And, you know, that I don't need to go any further with that analogy. 
Rainbows, right, which, you know, good old rainbow. Um, I'd say it's in better use now than ever before, a nice rainbow flag. I mean, when I was a kid, there was just a really bizarre um, television programme with a puppet who, when you got tired of talking to him, you could zip up his mouth, which I, I don't think that was a great image for kids. I think the ones today are much better. Anyway, what is a rainbow? Basically, it's the dispersion of light with rain by raindrops, by total internal reflection. Now, the light hits the raindrop, as you can see up here. It's right at the top here with water droplet. You see that? The light hits the raindrop. It gets refracted at the surface, totally internally reflected at the far surface, and then comes out again dispersed because they are refracted by different amounts at the two surfaces. The reason, of course, for the circle of the rainbow is the fact that it's reflecting on the circle of the raindrop, proving that a raindrop is not raindrop shaped. It's circular. It's a sphere because that's what the shape of a rainbow is. The shape of the rainbow is the shape of the droplet. And if you had one that was like pointy arch, like Gothic, then it would look like a raindrop shape. But it isn't a raindrop shape. It's a circle. And, that, and because it's a circle, we get circular rainbows. Now, what do you need? to have a rainbow. You need rain droplets, you need strong sunlight, and you also have to have your back to the sun. The sun has to be behind you. Only when the sun is behind you are you looking at a rainbow. If the sun is next to a rainbow, you know that's Photoshop. It's impossible. The sun has to be behind the observer for a rainbow to occur. So they're the three conditions. Rain, strong sunlight, the sun behind you. OK, critical angle. Now, critical angle can also create, there you are, refractive index. By measuring the critical angle, here it's been measured as 45 degrees, we can work out the refractive index using this formula, which is once again in the logbook. We write down the formula. We put in the number we know. In this case, the question would have said, 45 degrees is the critical angle, what's the refractive index? So we write down the formula. We replace the letter with the number first. There we are, sine of 45 is one over n. Then we work out the sine of 45. It turns out to be 0 0.7071. And if that's one over n, well then n is one over 0.7071, which turns out to be 1.41. And that's simply how we'd work out the refractive index. If we were doing it the opposite way around, the refractive index goes in for n, we turn it upside down and find the minus sine to the minus 1 of it. OK, this is a classroom challenge that uh, we use just to illustrate how these things worked and how, you know, we could perhaps understand it a little bit better. The first thing to understand is that 70 degree angle is not the one you use. We're looking to see where the ray of light goes after it strikes the prism. The first thing I have to draw is a normal, which is at 90 degrees. There's the normal. Oh, how beautifully drawn. And just with my finger too. And then we want that angle there. That angle is, of course, 20. Because the 70 and the 20, not 26, 20, there you are because the 70 and the 20 add up to 90 degrees. So that's 20 degrees, and we can then work out, using the 1.5 here, we can then work out that angle there. I'm going to call it x. And how are we going to find it? Well, the sine of i over the sine of r equals 1.5, the refractive index. So the sine of 20 degrees over the sine of r is equal to 1.5. And I think you can see where we're going from here. We simply swap them out. So the whole thing becomes the sine of r is the sine of 20 divided by 1.5. And we carry on from there. Uh, and this is the type of question we're going to be looking to do. Now, other uses of total internal reflection. Well, the most famous one is, of course, fibre optics. These are the optics used for all television, com telephone, audio, digital communication these days. Uh, anything which involving 
proper cabling is uh, fiber optics and total internal reflection is fiber optics. Basically light is bounced inside a small cable and the cable is made of glass, they're glass fibers and total internal reflection keeps the light inside. Now we're always coating these things. That's the, uh, that's the thing and that the red line is showing the coating. So optical fiber is a long thin transparent rod made of glass or plastic. Light is internally reflected from one end to the other, making it possible to send large chunks of information. Optical fibers can be used for communications by sending EM signals. You see, you used to get a lot of magnetic interference from one wire to another, and you can literally hear other people's conversations. You can't do that anymore because you don't get leakage from one to the next. Of course, you, as I was just about to quote before I remember we had this extra slide, you have to coat the, uh, the fibers with a low N plastic, i.e. something with a very low refractive index. This increases the amount of a total internal reflection you get because it changes the critical angle, but also it stops one strand leaking its light into another strand by contact because they were just glass. The light would literally go from one to the other and then you'd get interference again. You can also use it in endoscopes. This is where you stick uh, something into the human body and have a look inside if this is what you like. I mean, I think medical people use it as well. It's not just a hobby thing. Um, or binoculars, which use total internal reflection to uh, shorten the optical length of the, well, not to keep the same optical length, but to shorten the actual length of a telescope. So it's a telescope made shorter by total internal reflection, which is why binoculars weigh so much more than telescopes. Or periscopes, which are always used uh, in this way. Periscopes were never used in mirrors unless you're in a primary school. Every true periscope always uses prisms, as you can see by the diagram on the right. This is a periscope here. It's the gentleman using a periscope. Total internal reflection uh, in the prism is allowing the back part of the prism here to be used as if it was a mirror. Now, the advantage of this is that mirrors are very, very sensitive and Blocks of glass are not. You can do almost anything with them and they will still work. Now, modern uh, binoculars, of course, use plastic blocks instead to make them lighter. But the basic principle is shown by the diagram there, that you've, uh, you've caused the ray of light to travel slightly further than the length between the uh, eye lens and the object lens. And that is uh, an important way of shortening them so you can stick them in your pocket. OK, so we now move on to the questions. These are the questions I'll be setting. This is the diagram of the ray of light as it leaves the rectangular block of glass. As the ray of light leaves the block, it makes an angle theta. There you are, see now. The first thing you should spot is that he's done the naughty again. What has he done? He has used the wrong angle. The angle he should be using is this one, that's I, which in this case is 60 degrees. This angle is the angle you will find. That's the R, which you will find from sine I and sine R. Equal to the refractive index, because the refractive index is here, you see. It's given the N as 1.5, just like we had before. 1.5 is the refractive index of glass, so it's a bit difficult. I mean, you, you can get forms of glass with slightly higher or slightly lower, but it's so close to 1.5. I mean, plastic is slightly different. Water is very different, about 1.3. But glass is so close to 1.5 in almost all its uh, instances, it's always going to be like this in the question. So you work your way through that. And don't forget that when you're calculating the speed of the light, you're using the ratio of 1.5 again, the speed of light in air, 3 times 10 to the 8 in the glass, you used the formula that was earlier in the slideshow of that the refractive index is the speed in the air divided by the speed in the glass. Now I'll set one of these two. This is from 2018, so I'm quite probably uh, set this one as your question. It's um, a Snell's Law experiment question, comes up as often in this as anything else. And here's another one just to prove that it's not unusual. This one I think is from 2015. So they're a fairly common question to come up. Um, we'll work your way through the different things. I'd quite like you to freeze frame the last two, maybe go back, freeze frame the two of them, just in your head, go through these two questions and make sure you could understand them all. 
Uh, if you have time, drawing a suitable graph, you should remember that the suitable graph is sine i against sine r, which will give you the straight line through the origin. Um, if you plot i against r, you will not get a straight line, and you will not get any marks either, which is even more important. So, good luck with those two questions, and we'll move on to part three, lenses, or how I managed to see.